This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute honor and pleasure to welcome to Unstoppable. This this has actually been a little while in the making. I first set the intention for this podcast, I won't say a, a tremendous amount of time ago. It was probably maybe nine or 10 months ago when um, I was already aware of who you were, but it wasn't until I saw an interview with Aubrey Marcus and it was there was an opening statement that um, you were captioned. It was the lead into the entire podcast interview and it it rapture like it created rapture in me hmm. and so i'm so excited because it was in that moment i was like man i need to have a chat with this guy so it gives me a really great pleasure to welcome to the podcast uh the one the only dr zach bush thrilled to be here with all of you mate uh do you prefer dr zach bush or dr bush or dr zach or zach zach <laughs> <laughs> and so i don't know do you remember the quote no no like, do no. you mind if i <laughs> recite it yeah, for you go ahead. it was you, you said and this was the opening sa- statement per cubic centimeter the human body produces about 10,000 times more light than the surface of the sun, 10,000 times more efficient of releasing the light than it is at producing the light. We are stars. Why aren't you just, why aren't you blinding me right now? Because you're taking all of that light in and every proton acts as a black hole turning into a particle, turning it into a particle state. You have so much light and energy expressing itself as particles right now, which makes you uh, like a solid human being, but you're actually a solar event in a particular a particle state. I fucking mashed that <laughs> together. <laughs> That's good. But um, wh- where did where did that where does that knowledge come from? Where does that understanding come from? Where does that statement come from? Yeah, it basically takes us into a kind of a deep look at what is the physical matter of the universe, and yeah, there's a number of different spaces that we might call science or something like this, but. There's the idea that there's physics, which is kind of the physical properties of the universe, and then there's biology or life. And biology is an outspringing from physics. Actually, if you go a little bit deeper, it gets interesting that physics is actually an outspringing of what's called the only true science on the planet, which is philosophy, which is pretty psycho. So philosophy births physics, physics births biology. biology. What's the difference between physics and biology, or maybe better said, what allows life to happen is a concentration of light energy per cubic centimeter, per se. So per volume of space, how much energy can you produce or liberate in that space? And that's going to determine whether you're a star or an earthworm, which is burns much brighter. So not just the human burning bright, any multicellular organism is going to be roughly in that you know, 10,000 times fold the the concentration of light energy uh, than a nuclear event that we would call a star or sun. Because it was around that time that you came across my radar with the Aubrey Marcus interview, I discovered uh, quantum medicine, Mm -hmm. quantum biology. And quantum medicine, I think for a lot of people when it comes across their, their desk or in their sphere of awareness, it's often referred to as energy medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I discovered, you know, started to go down the rabbit hole, you know, studying people like, um, I can't remember the guy's name, Sachit Pranda, is mm-hmm. that his name? Uh, and Dr. Jack Cruz and really, and, and other people in that space and really started to understand, holy shit, like we are really solar panels for a battery. We are solar panels for immune system. We are solar panels for our own internal battery that produces light that is then recaptured by us, that produces and uh, directs so many functions within our body. And when you start to dig into, I guess you could say that, that philosophy now science, it really marries up quite strongly with, you know, what was articulated by the ancients, you know, thousands of years ago in scriptures that we, you know, we are beings of light, we are luminous beings. Um, and I suppose when you look at it from the perspective of, well, we've got temperature uh, and we have infrared energy that's being produced, it goes well beyond that. Yeah, and the interesting thing is there's uh, a little bit of a, you know, anthropocentric kind of human perspective that it's tempting to say that the human body is this bright or is a light being or whatnot. But the humbling reality is that there is no capacity of the human cell to make light energy. The only organism that's capable of really releasing that sunshine within biology is these tiny little bacteria that we've come to re- refer to as mitochondria. Yeah. So in Archaea, which is one of the most ancient bacteria to appear on the planet some you know, four billion years ago, absorbed a, a methane-producing methyl bacterium. And so this, this tiny little guy living inside of an Archaea uh, learned to co-create a, a new form of energy release. 
most single-celled organisms, whether it be a bacterium, a protozoa, or a mycelial network of fungi, all of those are, you know, despite the scale that they might look like a mycelial network covering acres of land, is still a single-celled organism that's in a cooperative relationship with other single cells. All of those rely on fermentation for, for light energy. Fermentation is a relatively inefficient way of liberating energy, but it's still roughly a thousand times brighter than, you know, physics. And so there is this concentration of energy that allows a single cell organism to become animated. Uh, the complexity of a single cell is pretty stunning. You've got you know, billions of atoms that are now coordinating a distributed and specialized system of, of cooperation, basically. So you have specific enzymes that are proteins folded into machines that can actually run and do something. They can detox your body. They can run up and down a, a strip of other proteins to create a muscle fiber or whatever it is. So all of this subspecialization is happening down at the molecular level of a single-celled organism like a bacterium. And it takes so much energy to coordinate that. And, you know, it's not you know, out of human exp macro experience to see that. To, to have a city takes a certain concentration of energy. And you can see cities from space because they light up. Uh, we produce an enormous amount of energy to allow for telecommunications, transportation, uh, you know, mining, manufacturing, all these things take a concentration of energy. So anytime you create complex systems, you have to up-level the amount of energy per cubic centimeter. And so a city is basically a multicellular organism, therefore demanding more energy than, you know, the the little village model or perhaps the, the fiefdom model where there's one house and the goat and the thing and the little, you know, fence or no fence. And so as we move up the scale of complexity to try to coordinate more and more complex social systems, which you could describe at a single cell level, even as a social system, there's an increasing demand of energy. And about 3 billion years ago, there was this major upgrade where they, that mitochondrial uh, event occurred where this organism could now live inside of other cells. And so it's such a tiny bacterium that it could live inside of a protozoa. And that became the first prokaryotes. Uh, and the prokaryotes are you know, commonly referred to as parasites and things like this, but they're super uh, complex cells and they start to behave as an animal would with kind of seemingly intelligent behavior. They can chemo attract, they do all kinds of things that bacterium can't do. And so there was this upgrade in energy with the mitochondrial thing and, and allowing those, you know, parasites slash protozoa to start to swap information by bumping into each other. They could share genes. We see this emergence of, of more and more complicated relationships between cells and ultimately multicellular life, uh, nematodes, and ultimately all kinds of worms and, and crustaceans and all this, and then ultimately into higher and higher life forms. And the interesting you know, progression there is not just at the energy level, it's also at the uh, biodiversity level. And so as you see the intelligence of creatures grow over the last few billion years, what you're really looking at is not only the concentration of energy production, but the concentration of biodiverse information streams. And so the more species that can communicate into a single system, the more intelligence that system produces. Has your understanding of any produ energy production changed in the last, say, 20, 30 years? And the reason I ask is because as I've delved into the quantum medicine space, you know, I've always, I guess, because I subscribe to the basic understanding, and my, my understanding is quite infantry, like very infant like. Um, you know, we take in, you know, either a, a glucose or a fat molecule into the mitochondria. It, you know, it essentially, you know, is transported along the electron transport chain. And by the time it gets to the fifth, uh, the fifth, what's it called? Crida, chroma, what's the fifth? Uh, in the mitochondria? Yeah. So you're looking at kind of the f fifth enzymatic step in releasing yeah. that sunlight from the carbon molecule? Wow. Again, getting back to my understanding is, you know, we would then, you know, we'd transport that, let's call it that energy across the, the electron transport chain, get to the fifth, fifth carbon, Christ, what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm having that moment. Uh, the fifth stage yeah. or the fifth gate, and then it would produce ATP. But now... That one's almost eight down, but yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. so ATP is at the very end of the respiratory transport chain. So okay. the respiratory cycle or the or the electron transport chain is, yeah, the liberation of electrons or light energy from long-chain carbons. And the best battery ever devised on the planet is a double carbon bond, which is sunlight that's been stored between two carbons, basically. And right. it, doesn't, it doesn't diminish in its energy state like typical batteries. You lose your, you know, you leave your cell phone off a charger for four days, even without any use. It, 
even if it's off, the battery is going to go dead. Uh, even if you leave a battery in its box, never plugged into a, you know, an apparatus, it's going to go dead over a couple of years period because it's losing, it takes energy to store energy. The double carbon bond requires no energy to store energy. And so it really is the perfect, most efficient battery ever devised in nature. And we've completely ignored it. And so, yeah, my, my concept of energy definitely changed radically over the last 20 years. I was developing chemotherapy at the University of Virginia back in the day. So in 2005, 2010, I was in, you know, in drug, drug development um, using the endocrine and metabolism uh, specialty that I had as an entry point into chemotherapy, which was a little bit novel at the time. And I was studying the ability to turn on cell suicide in cancer cells by feeding nutrients to cells instead of trying to poison them with chemotherapy. What if we gave them high high density nutrition. So we were using really high dose vitamin A compounds and cancer cells can't handle high dose vitamin A and turns on cell suicide. And so it was a cool process of being able to feed somebody to health rather than poison them to try to eliminate disease. And so that was, you know, my first turning point of how we could nutrify the planet instead of poison the planet as an approach to, you know, cancer management. And then as it went further, it was a re revelation that life utilizes carbon as a resource. And by this time, 2005, 2010, Al Gore came out with his big story of, you know, the poison of CO2 in the atmosphere and, you know, this whole political narrative of, of global warming through CO2. And it was pretty obvious by the time I'm doing chemotherapy research, wait, everything breathes CO2. It's impossible that that's causing any sort of crisis on the planet. Absolutely impossible that that's the problem for whatever cataclysmic event we think we're in as humans. And so th that took me about four more years before we started to realize that the, you know, one of the reasons humans are sucking the energy out of the planet is because we believe in waste. All of our waste that's poisoning the planet right now is long carbon chains. And so we have all these double carbon bonds storing light energy in the form of plastics, tires, agriculture waste, and all of that is going up in methane and CO2 as it rots slowly. Whereas we could be capturing that energy and running our trains, buses, airplanes, literally off of our farm fields, not by ethanol like we're currently doing with corn, but literally the waste product. So harvest the food for the humans and then your waste product, the corn cob and all these other things are giving you common word was bagasse, which is billions and billions of pounds globally of sugar cane left after you harvest the sugar out of it. So that sugar cane is loaded with long carbon chains that are waiting to be you know, energetic released. And if you don't capture that as humans and you say, well, it's waste, we're just going to let it rot over here, the bacteria, they're going to break that back down into CO2 and off gas in the atmosphere. Or we could recapture that and put that carbon energy back into the cycle. And so if we were as efficient as microbes at managing energy, there would be no role for fossil fuels all the carbon is on the surface of the planet that we need to be energy free basically at this point. And so that, you know, among other things it birthed a, a energy company for me. So I run an energy company that's you know working on a, we built a 40 foot mitochondria to deal with carbon waste into biofuel. So when you say a 40 foot, you built a 40 foot mitochondria. Yeah. We basically used bio, you know, biomimicry. So we mentioned that respiratory chain. Yeah. It's an eight, eight step process that mitochondria break down all carbon, long chains into fuel and um, so we basically did the same thing so you can put into this you know reactor tires plastics farm waste and and you get the same output basically slightly different ratios of of your outputs but in the end you've got you know valuable commodities coming out of this thing whole thing runs under a vacuum so there's no emissions during the process and so it mimics that mitochondrial environment where everything is captured back into resource so the mitochondria have zero waste every single thing that comes out of there and you know, they use the whole buffalo kind of mindset of nature's never done waste so why have we chosen to so as you start to imagine a human species that that eliminates waste into resource or transforms or transmutes waste into resource, you realize this planet can certainly handle 8 billion people in that state because there is no net loss. And so this is where we're at right now, I think, in all of our projects is helping retell a story that humans don't need to be the largest problem on the planet. We can actually be part of the co-creation of an infinite energy source that we would call human behavior. So with what you're describing, you're essentially saying that we could uh, completely change the way that we looked at waste right now as a perspective, but also change the way we look at the way that we're producing waste because there's a lot of people who are anti-plastics and we need to get rid of plastics and i think the the supermarkets have done an incredible job of uh 
you know, creating this appearance whereby they're saying, oh, we, we want to get rid of plastic bags, but what we're going to do is we're not going to get rid of them. We're just now going to charge you for the plastic bags, but yeah. there's still plastic bag waste. And in most cases, you know, uh, denser plastic, you know, <laughs> less biodegradable plastic than there was before. But what you're saying is with a reactor like this, we can essentially take that plastic, produce energy, which then essentially removes the requirement for us to um, use plastic less. Unless, of course, we're looking at other health factors. I mean, you use plastic less, but you also the plastic doesn't get ended up in the ocean because yeah. you suddenly put in a monetary you know value on it, and then you're suddenly recapturing plastic from everywhere you can possibly find it because it's your primary Modern. fuel source. Yeah. And so, it's a very interesting proposition that when we start to see a world with zero waste, it it remetrics our value system literally for macroeconomics for microeconomics to you know productivity measurements in a single company you know you have a, a, a top line and a bottom line now and that top line bottom line of your company is entirely measured by money but what if your top line was measuring the amount of you know upcycled carbon as its primary source and so instead of carbon as the problem carbon becomes the asset for for your company and the amount of microplastics and macroplastics that you're collecting from your community to, you know, power your productivity is would be an interesting metric. You know, so these are just ways in which biology uh, practices in a, a state of and belief system of abundance. Humans have always practiced in a state of scarcity, and that's really when we start to drive down on I think the original wound like why do we behave different than all of the other species why are we the only species that seems to suck life out of the planet why are we the ones that hunt everything to extinction around us and I think it's because we're the only species that's come along here on the planet to think that we're actually separate from nature you said that at the beginning of the conversation like something you're quite passionate about right now is addressing this whole perspective that humanity is the problem um, but you, you just said we literally have evolved to see ourselves not being able to live in harmony with the planet. Where did it all go wrong? I mean, our oldest myths are that we got rejected by nature. You know, we got kicked out of the garden. So almost every you know, religious tale tells a story of humans becoming sinful or becoming so damaged or separated from God that we got rejected. And so there's this, this hero's journey kind of narrative that we have adopted to justify, I think, the, the way that we feel inside. We feel lonely inside. And at my third subspecialty in medicine was around hospice and palliative care. And so when I was admitting 80 patients a week to, to die, basically, I got to see a lot of people right at this, this rebirth moment. And over and over again, I saw repeats of what I had seen in the ICUs when I was an internal medicine doc in the hospitals. Was that at that moment that people let go of the body and have their near-death experience and then come back into the body? Over and over again, you hear, I was completely accepted in that other space. And the fact that that's even a sentiment that you would, you know, come back to tell us is pretty fascinating because it means that everybody's walking around feeling unaccepted. And so I think there's a deep, deep emotional wound within humanity that has come to believe by somebody's story or another that we are not enough and we have been rejected by nature. I don't mean to bring race into this, but I'm going to, not because I'm trying to create division, but I am genuinely curious because I've had my own my own um, ponderings on this because when you look at indigenous cultures, they are so aligned with nature. They do work with nature. They are such a, um, a collaborative force with nature. But then you have white man, you know, with his, with his industry and his... You know, and his profit and his capitalistic nature, and he seems to be at a loss to be able to find that that synergy. Why is it that there are so many indigenous cultures that are essentially the example of what you're talking about here, where they haven't been rejected by nature? Yet there's this mainstream, um, let's call it white culture, and I don't mean to be racist, mm -hmm. but that's what I see. Mm -hmm. um, that you know seems to have this burden. Um, that comes, you know, deeply rooted in perhaps a religious context or a story that, you know, could be centuries old or thousands of years old. Yeah, I think, you know, we can, to kind of take it out of the, the race scenario, we can kind of go a little higher to realize that, you know, my, my background genetically is Celtic and the Celtic genocide was one of the first efforts to a complete, towards a complete genocide of a peoples. And that was arbitrated by Julius Caesar in ancient Rome, trying to annihilate the the Celts. The Celts were white and the Celts looked like, you know, the Scotch-Irish and the Scotch-Irish looked like, you know, the British. 
but th- but there was a deep schism you know, between those groups and doing a lot of work in Africa now I can tell you that there's a lot of deep racial tension between blacks there and there's deep racial and socioeconomic tension between you know the the 200 different groups in India they all have generally the same skin color and so it, it goes beyond skin color and it really comes down to narrative or, or storytelling and so somewhere between my Celtic ancestors living 1500 years ago and the you know or 2,500 years ago, give it. So 2,500 years ago to Julius Caesar, 2,000 years ago, somewhere in that 500-year period, there was a sudden schism, a sudden change of the narrative towards this belief that we'd been rejected from, by nature, by God. And this led to a change in philosophy in the, at the sociopolitical level where we moved from natural law to what became known as you know, divine right or divine law in which we believed that the emperor had direct contact with God and only the emperor knew God's will and we all followed the emperor because they were talking to God. And so that roughly, you know, boils all the way down to modern, you know, royalty on the planet today with the British, you know, model of of the monarchy and all that. So monarchies were somewhere in that mix of starting to other themselves from the rest of humanity saying, you know, you all don't have access to God, but we do. And so you're going to have to listen to us and, and we're going to tell you the story. So does the narrative come from a place of control? Where yeah, for sure. And, and that that desire for control comes from a belief of scarcity ultimately. Right. So if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary and look up the word nature, it, it says that it is, it is the entire phenomenon of life on earth, including minerals, plants, animals, everything except for humans or anything humans have created. That's the English definition of nature. Wow. And so the English literally wrote humans and everything we've made out of nature. And so that's that Julius Caesar kind of phenomenon of, you know, from ancient Rome to the British Empire, we we really kept formulating this belief that humans don't fit into nature. Nature is against humans. And so there's not enough resources. So we need to go conquest. We need to go get more resources. We need more mineral wealth. We need more food. We need more things. And so we need to create slavery so we can have more minerals, so we can have more food, all of this. And so these these states of scarcity came from this deep wound that we might call the wounded masculine in the sense that that kind of hunting gathering mode moved from hunting gathering what we need today to wow, we need more than we need today. We need to make sure that our kids two generations out are taken care of. And what if somebody came and took something from us, then we wouldn't have enough. And so now we need a bigger military and we need all this stuff. So it was in that somewhere around, I think a couple thousand years ago that we really had that break. And maybe it was as far back as 5,000 years, but I think there's some sort of demarcation between you know ancient Egypt, which was kind of 12,000 to 5,000 years ago, and then modern Egypt, you know, 5,000 years ago to current day where we we see this sudden change in societal value systems societal fear guilt shame paradigms that come out of that scarcity model and so you're saying this is fundamentally based on a narrative which is somewhere between five and fifteen thousand years old and in order to shift this narrative the narrative needs to change so how how do we create a change in the narrative when we are essentially, well, and sometimes I guess for some people it feels like we've got so much momentum in an, in an existing narrative. And I know there's probably some people out there who feel like it's impossible to change the path that we're on right now. You know, we're headed for a course of destruction. You know, we're headed for the fifth greatest extinction event or the sixth greatest extinction event. Uh, I've lost count. Um, how do we change? Yeah. No pressure. I think that Buck, you know, Buck, Mr. Fuller said something interesting, which, you know, I'll probably misquoted a bit, but he basically said there's no point in putting any energy into ending the current, you know, paradigm. It's more effective to create the new paradigm that makes the current one obsolete. And so for me, I think that's the path I'm feeling the most excitement and joy around is I don't need to worry about the path we're carrying on, which absolutely is towards extinction. And that was you know, a lot of my work over the years as, as a physician scientist has been in looking for root cause reasons we are going extinct. Like, why, how are we biologically going extinct? And the answers come down to small molecule f- chemistry, basically. And so glyphosate is the, the primary toxin on the planet. It's the leading herbicide or weed killer used globally, 4 billion pounds or 
two and a half billion kilograms are used every year into the soil systems of the planet. And so two and a half billion kilograms of this poison is dumped in. It functions as an antibiotic, kills all the bacteria, fungi, earthworms, everything else in soil systems, then gets picked up by the water systems because it's a water-soluble molecule, cycles through the entire water cycle. 85% of the air we breathe is contaminated. 85% of the rainfall is contaminated. So we've poisoned the whole earth with this thing. And so I got very passionate about saying, you know, we've poisoned the earth. This molecule disrupts our immune system. It disrupts our endocrine system undermining fertility, undermining longevity, un, you know, responsible for the cancer epidemic, the neurodegenerative conditions of Alzheimer's, autism in children, these things. And so I was very passionate about kind of saying, here's why we're going extinct and we got to change these things and all that. And fast forward 15 years and it's like, that that's now inevitable. We've set off these nuclear bombs at the genetic level that are going to take us five generations from now to actually see how much damage we've actually done because it accumulates generationally even if we stopped all the toxins today. And so we can say that we have extincted the current human race. I, I believe that's probably done. true. That's done. And so who are we going to become that becomes resilient beyond that current mm -hmm. reality? And so what do we need to create as the new paradigm of being human on this planet that becomes so resilient that it overcomes the toxicity that we've unleashed in our genetics? Is extinction just a natural course? Is that a natural part of nature? Because I was watching, um, my son loves um, David Attenborough, any documentaries on nature. And there was a new one that came out on Netflix recently. I think it's called The Living Earth. Yep. It's narrated by Nor Morgan Freeman. And it was actually, I guess, from looking at it, I don't know if you've ever watched kids programs and you see the sub narrative and you're like, oh, fuck, that's really, you know, that's a little bit naughty. That's a bit rude. Mm -hmm. uh, but the kids are like, they can't see it because, you know, the, the, it's quite a objective perspective or subjective from the parents' perspective. And as I was listening to this, I was actually going, fuck, I feel like we're being almost teased here. You know, because he basically said, and the punchline was 99% of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. Only 1% of all species that have ever existed are still alive today. And so when I heard that, I was like, it's inevitable. We're, we're, we are as a species. At some point, every species is either going to um, it's either going to evolve or it's going to be wiped out or it's going to be uh, evolved through some kind of mass extinction event. I get frustrated at those narratives. I, I honestly think it's sociopolitically motivated um, mm. to make it sound like... It felt like, like an, adver ad an advertisement. Like It felt like this big advertisement saying, this is what's coming for you. Yeah. Yeah, and it creates a sense of hopelessness in your heart, mm. creates a sense of inevitability of, you know, this path to, to destruction. Um, it's just not true, it, and, and it's sad that to <laughs> say that in some ways. But the reason it's not true at the right now moment is because if you, if you say 99% of species over 4 billion years have gone extinct, that's an irrelevant number because the 1% that's currently here is more biodiverse on this planet than any other time in history. We have more biodiversity in this chapter of the planet than any other time in 4 billion years. So is it relevant that bacterium from 3 billion years ago went extinct or mollusks that were in the ocean 2 billion years ago went extinct? That's absolutely irrelevant. What's relevant is every time nature has gone through a challenge, she rebirths herself with more biodiversity, more beauty, and more intelligence every time. Hmm. Nature has never taken a pause on this planet and it has never gone backwards. When the dinosaurs went extinct 55 million years ago, nature did not try to recreate the Triceratops. Nature instead created birds, dolphins, blue whales, monkeys, humans. We came out of the collective imagination of nature when it died. An extinction event is the moment that nature reimagines itself in a more complex, more intelligent, more diverse, and more beautiful way. And it happens through viruses, which is kind of beautiful because here, just like CO2, we find ourselves demonizing the very mechanisms by which nature creates her beauty. CO2 is the energy source for life to occur, period. If we demonize that and we start saying that we need to pump that out of the atmosphere and hide it underground because it's the demon, we're going to extinct this planet for millions of years, not just a few thousand, because life cannot exist without CO2. If we start demonizing viruses and pouring antiviral chemical compounds into our air and you know, airplanes and bodies so that we're safe, we're going to poison the imagination of the next iteration of life. And so we need to stop demonizing nature. We need to understand that nature only does the right thing all the time. It only does the next stretch for the next beauty to emerge. And every time it's better. 
because all of the collective life that's here right now is now participating in a co-creation of the next iteration of life on the planet. At the time of the dinosaur's extinction, the only macroflora on the planet, i.e. plants and trees, were palms and ferns. After that extinction, we get wildflowers, deciduous trees. You know, it's just, you can't even begin to appreciate that ferns dreamed up wildflowers. That trees that we would call palms dreamed up pine trees and oak trees and elm trees and birch trees. And none of that existed until extinction forced a new opportunity. And so we are now being told that we are the cataclysmic problem of the planet. We are the crisis on the planet. We are the cancer on the planet. And we are going to kill the planet. And we're going to cause the sixth extinction. We've certainly accelerated the rate of extinction of species over the last 50 years by 10,000 times. So we're, we are a cataclysmic stressor on the planet right now. But a stress is exactly what nature is looking for to do her next iteration. Because when you put an organism under stress, it starts making viruses. When my body goes under stress, miss a few nights of sleep, you know, a lot of psychosocial stress at home, economic stress at the office, my body starts making new variants of the genes that are, are sensing that I can't survive in my current state of stress. And so when my stress level supersedes my capacity for repair, which can happen in an instant, I spend too much time out in the sun and I burn myself to a crisp, at that moment, there's lots of proteins and other structures in my body that are saying, okay, I can't survive under these current situations, so where, where is adaptation possible? And it starts misspelling genes and putting those out into the atmosphere around me, into my bloodstream for other cells to take up, to reimagine life within my own body. I am constantly updating my genome. I'm constantly becoming the stronger, better version of myself. So a virus is an evolutionary response? A virus is simply a genetic library of the future's possibilities. And so when you, okay, so I find that really confronting because when people get run down and they become sick, oftentimes when they become sick, unless something changes, uh, it doesn't get, like they don't get better. You know, oftentimes they get more run down, more sick, more susceptible. So at what point does the virus become the next version or the next iteration of what is required for nature to flourish. How, how, how is that? Where's the intersection for that? So there's, you know, a misperception of this thing that we call sickness. Uh, we see it as a bad thing because humans are so good at categorizing things as good and evil. And we just do it subconsciously all the time. Dark is bad. Light is good. You know, these very basic observations of nature. We somehow create a... a you know, ethical decision about <laughs> these elements of nature that are certainly nothing wrong with darkness. Without darkness, there'd be no space. Without darkness, you couldn't see the moon. Without darkness, you, there would be no opportunity for the vacuum space to emanate with Planck's constant to create the gravitational field that we all... There's just nothing bad about darkness. You can't have light without the darkness. Things, things are real. And so... Yet, we look at this thing and say, well, somebody's healthy and running around running a marathon. They must be super well. So we're going to say that's good. Here's somebody who yesterday spiked a fever, feels exhausted, is laying in bed. They must be sick. They must be bad. That, that's bad health. This over here is good health. When you get a fever, you actually kill more cancer cells in the next few hours than you ever did running the fucking marathon. <laughs> you know, and so it's like the, we are wrong about those two events. The, the person who's healing the most, doing the deepest work of being a new human being, is the person laying in bed with a fever. So we need to lose our judgment of what is health, what is sickness, and recognize that biology is always looking for the next upgrade. A virus, it cannot take over a human cell apparatus, as has been shown to you. Viruses don't move into your body and take over your cells to make themselves to replicate themselves and then spit themselves out in some sort of like robotic AI takeover of your cellular apparatus. This does not happen. It's now been scientifically evidenced for 25 years now that the most regulated decision in your body is which proteins are you gonna make today? Which genes are you going to turn into proteins? What are you gonna turn into life? A virus entering your system is just one of the many gene options that you have to, tomorrow to create the new body. As I sit here talking to you guys, I have somewhere around 10 to the 8th 
different viruses coursing through my bloodstream. That's roughly 100 billion different viruses running through my bloodstream right now. And every cell in my body over the next 25 minutes or so will surveil all 10 billion of those. And if there's one of those that looks like a good opportunity for upgrade, it may start making that new protein. And that single cell will make that decision. There's 250 checks and balances at the gene level to make that decision and make sure it's right. And so you have to say 250 times, are you sure you want to make this protein? Are you absolutely positive? And so again and again, if you see something that's checked and balanced 250 times, it means that nature has huge resilience and respect for that moment. This is the most important decision you will make is genetically who are you going to become tomorrow? There's more protein enzymatic work being done in your body to decide that next upgrade than any other mechanism in your body right now. More than your brain's working, more than anything else, is this step of genetic regulation of this. So the model of a virus is breathed in and suddenly you make this virus and you get sick because you're weak and that virus is attacking you is the narrative we need to lose. When a new virus comes into our environment through a biologic process, it, there is a decision-making tree that happens in every single cell. If suddenly a large percentage of your cells say, oh, I'm going to take this protein up and I'm going to make that protein over and over again for a good three or five days, I'm going to replicate this at a high, high rate so that the rest of my body has to respond to this protein. This is good for everything. This, there, that is a very big decision your body has made. And your body is now going to put all of its energy into this upgrade to the physiology. And during that time, you don't have enough energy to go run around checking your emails and everything else because your body has decided it's going to upgrade, upgrade 70 trillion human cells into this new genetic relationship, this new protein synthesis. And so we're doing this constantly. We're deciding do we need a big upgrade or not. The more stress you put your body under, the more likely you need that big upgrade. So who is it that actually gets quote unquote sick? It's the person that's under the most stress all the time. And so how is it, if, if viruses really attacked people, then how is it that, you know, family of six, suddenly two people get fever and all this, and the other four kind of cruise on and don't get anything? Or maybe two of them get super quote unquote sick and have high fever, and one of them just gets a little bit of a cough and moves on. What happened to those other three or four people? Did they not get attacked? No, they're certainly breathing the same virus. They're touching the same stuff. They're eating the same food. They're, they're consumed by the same opportunity for upgrade, and they didn't choose it. Why didn't they choose it? Because their body's already decided, no, I'm already in a thrive state. I don't need a stimulus. There's no cancer cells in my body. I don't need a spike of fever. I don't need to do any of these other things. So this, this process towards regeneration, which looks like a lot of cells dying so that something new can birth, we call it sickness. We need to kind of rebrand that probably to upgrade or you know, is that why Apple, we look iPhone, at a child, a child as its immune system is developing, it's more susceptible to being sick. But the more viruses that it experiences, the more upgrades it goes through to the point where it, it achieves a level of resilience in its immune system and it, it is able to be exposed to things without getting sick. Is there a fine line then between once you've achieved a sufficient level of upgrade where people go, well, man, I'm, I'm fully upgraded now. I can eat whatever I want. I can drink whatever I want. I can party whatever I want because, you know, if I get sick, then it's just my body upgrading. Is there a point where it becomes the upgrades can, or the lifestyle, or there are perhaps other environmental factors that perhaps don't align with the upgrade and can maybe take the organism backwards? We don't have any evidence that viruses kill anybody ever. You know, the, the, nobody dies of a viral illness. People can have downstream consequences of the stress of an upgrade. Yeah. And so if I don't have the energetic resources to make the upgrade, and I only can do it halfway, then I, then I have chronic fatigue after the, the viral illness. The virus is only in my bloodstream for three days, no matter what. But now I have chronic COVID or I have chronic, you know, I have HIV, but now I have AIDS, you know, or whatever it is. HIV is not the thing that drives the condition of AIDS and coronavirus never killed anyone. The downstream consequences of the immune system level is that the reservoir was too low to make the upgrade. And in this effort of this kind of drained reservoir, all of the biologic functions start to be dysfunctional. And so what's the reservoir? The reservoir is basically your your repair mechanism, so your your coping mechanism. So you is have that a your reservoir. immune system or 
There's lots of different functions. So immune system would be definitely one of them, but anything from your bone marrow production of red blood cells to your muscle cells and your ability to rebuild actin, myosin, and nitric oxide reservoirs in your bloodstream. So every single cell in the body has a reservoir of repair mechanisms. So it's almost like a reserve. It's like yeah. the brain has a level of reserve. It can take a few hits, but once you start tapping into the reserve, then you start getting cognitive decline. Every brain can have a seizure is a yeah. good example of it. Every single brain is capable of having a seizure. It just depends on how much neurotransmitter do you have available right now and what's the level of stress on the organism. So how do we maintain solid reservoirs to support the upgrade? It really comes down to having a lifestyle in which your energy production exceeds your energy demands. And so this is where healthy lifestyles come in. So what is a healthy lifestyle? A healthy lifestyle is where you are injuring yourself at a lower rate and than you repair. Okay. And if you, for 10 years, are living in an environment where you are are injuring yourself less often than your, or your, the energy on, on injury is less than the energy of repair, you're going to be super robust. You have a deep reservoir. You can go, you know, jump out of bed in the morning and decide, you know what, today I'm going to go uh, take a weekend off and go climb Everest or whatever it is. And I'm going to go do this ridiculous exercise outlet that I haven't trained for. I haven't done anything, but I've got this deep reserve and I can go tap into that. As we age and we slow down in energy production because our mitochondrial metabolism is slowing down, we, we tend to lose the garden over time because of the amount of toxins we're exposed to as we age. And so our mitochondrial reservoir is decreasing. And if you had to pick any one definition of what is aging, it would be your mitochondria. So is that your, the heteroplasmy? Your, your, your mitochondrial reservoir. Okay. And so how many mitochondria per human cell? Yeah. That, that 10,000 X per cubic centimeter is because every cell when you're two years old is crammed full of mitochondria. There's 200 mitochondria per human cell. A neuron has 2,000 mitochondria in it. And so you are just teeming with these bacterial life within you when you're two. Yeah. When you're 20, you've lost about one and a half to 2% of your mitochondria every year until that point. So you're down to you know about an 80% threshold of where you were. By the time you're 80, you're down to you know, a 10, 15% reservoir of what you were when you were two. Neuroscience told us for a very long time that once you get to a certain age, I think it was around 27, 28, you've got all the neurons you're ever gonna have. And once you start losing them, that's it. But then we started discovering things around neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. Uh, and we started to become aware that we can actually re reproduce neurons. What about what about the mitochondria? Is mitogenesis is that something that we can engage in in order to keep up a robust reservoir of mitochondria so that our reservoirs for energy stay robust, or perhaps rather than decreasing over time, have the potential to maybe not increase as much as what they would when we're early young, but perhaps maybe not as decline as fast if perhaps even reverse the aging process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mitochondria are bacteria which have very short lives. So typical bacterium has about a three-day you know, lifespan to it. Your mitochondria are probably slightly longer lived than that, but not much. You know, They, they have a, a pretty holy of holies kind of existence. pH is always identical inside your cell. Nutrients are always available. Like they've kind of got the best possible situation. And so you've got... Uh, you know, there's subspecialized bacteria living in a pretty cush environment typically. And so that's, that gives them a little bit longer life. But if your mitochondria only have, you know, seven to 14 day lifespan, you've got to be proliferating all the time. So your mitochondria are reproducing from, from the moment you're conceived. Uh, interestingly, at conception, you only got your mitochondria from mom. The sperm dumps its mitochondria before it infects the, the ovum with its genetics. And so there is no mitochondrial DNA from dad. And so it's only mother's DNA that you inherit at the mitochondrial level. And so the mitochondria inside of the egg becomes your, your basically petri dish that will now populate every single dividing cell. And you've seen the classic cell division maybe with mitosis and all the genes line up in the middle and they pulls apart and those chromosomes you know, pull apart and then double themselves to, to recreate the, the whole chromosome picture. What it's not showing you is that the mitochondria are also polarized inside the cell to make sure that there was mitochondria in both offspring. And interestingly, the mitochondria in all of their replication, which is happening so frequently in your body, you know, over this course of the conversation, 10% of your you know, mitochondria might be new over the next couple of hours. It depends on kind of what's going on in the body and everything else. But let's say it's only 1% of your mitochondria are rebirthed. We now recognize that mitochondrial DNA is far more plastic than human DNA or any other organism, even bacterium. 
that live outside the cell and and that specif or that uh, flexibility of of genetics that the mitochondria looks to be like one of the reasons we're so adaptive is that we can have a sudden stressor at the metabolic level and we there's at least a few ba bacteria or mitochondria inside your cells that have figured out a different genetic sequence that can flourish in that environment and so the amount of genetic thrive it seems to be maximized in mitochondria more than any other ecosystem on the planet. So their ability for adaptation is is so, so robust. Interestingly, we're now having to blur our definition of human D DNA because we're starting to find that, in fact, mitochondria are so good at misspelling their, their genes that when it comes to genes that are very important for their persistence, i.e. their fertility, their reproduction, they don't store those genes in their little circular DNA. They actually transport that DNA strip that they need all the time to be unchanging over to the human DNA and st stored in the human nucleus. Mm. How the mitochondria are able to then go and recover that gene out of the human nu nucleus and then take it into the cytoplasm without going in there is beyond us. Somehow it sends a single t signal to the human nucleus inside the, the complex bundled chromatin, you know, that's bundled up DNA inside of your human cell nucleus, which is huge. A single nucleus of, of human DNA holds almost a meter of DNA. And so hidden in that meter of DNA is mitochondrial genes that need to be accessed every few days for the mitochondria to proliferate. So is it almost like the mitochondria are some kind of transceiver, like they're sending and receiving signals constantly? Totally. There's yeah. constant co-communication across the species all the time in your body. completely separate from your grandmother's cell phone that's 400 kilometers away, but you can pick that up and within you know a split second be talking to grandma's if she's in the room. But that cell phone has no ability to transmit information more than a couple hundred yards, so how the hell does it do that? It hits a cell phone tower that then projects that long distance so that you eventually get to grandma there. And so it's that s system of cell phone towers that connect us to the world that make that thing thing. Well, the, the body makes cell phone towers too. And those cell phone towers are not physical structures, but biochemical procedures where you're creating this, this transfer of energy through the, the etheric environment of the, the air of the, the body, if you will. And so that, that transmission of information is happening because the bacteria and fungi, again, understanding that not, there is no such thing as waste, when it takes the long ch chain carbon and turns it into fuel, there's metabolites or small breakdown products on the side that isn't ATP or isn't energy. It looks like a bunch of waste products of the cell. It turns out those waste products, quote unquote, from the, the bacteria and fungi of soil systems or your gut or your intracellular environment are the mechanism of communication. And so those waste products are the redox signaling molecules. And so... Uh, that's what our lab has been doing is showing that if you take, you know, ancient soil systems that predate the chemical, you know, destruction that we've done to, to the Earth's soils, if you take that communication network and put human cells in them, they regenerate faster than we've, we even knew was possible. And so it's an exciting story that a healthy lifestyle that would give you that deep reserve where sickness is not necessary for the upgrade or if sickness comes for the upgrade you have plenty of energy to cycle through that in 24 hours and you feel great the next day and you go back to work that level of vitality is directly related to your biodiversity within your body and the soil systems you eat from the the air systems and of the, the microbiology that you're breathing the water systems and their natural connection that you might be bathing in all of those ways in which you touch nature are going to determine how much communication is happening inside the body for repair and regeneration. With unfettered access to information, the body never dies, never diseases. It's in this constant regeneration, stem cells, the whole thing. If you see aging happening and disease occurring, it's because there's a drop in communication, a decrease in biodiversity, a decrease in energy production decrease of coordinated repair and regeneration. So that, that's all pretty macro. So what you're saying is the more biodiversity we have at all the different touch points, 
uh, the greater capacity we have to be able to produce energy and mitochondria within the cell. Yeah. If we get down to the micro aspects of that, what does that look like from a lifestyle perspective, from a choices perspective? Basically, what, how much nature can you touch in a day? Yeah, literally. So, yeah. And so, and, and it's... And how not, close you not, are to the source of the food as well. Yeah, which is a big piece of your nature that you interact with is obviously the food you touch. And, you know, it's the fastest way for you to get to minerals and micronutrients and all that stuff that's going to be necessary to fuel your soil system into health. It's your fertilizer. The food you're eating is just fertilizer for your garden. That's all. And something I read recently was about the importance of being able to, the closer you are able to touch the food from where it came from without um, any chemical interference, the more of the, like, for example, if you're able to touch an apple that's been picked directly from the tree without it being washed or um, sterilized, you're actually in contact with greater levels of biodiversity than if you're getting an apple that's been packaged for six months, it's been sprayed, um, and sure. then you're just eating it out of a... Yeah, and it's at every level too. It's it's tempting as a microbiology you know, bacteria guy that, to say that it's because of the bacteria and all those things, but it's, it's multi-level, which is kind of just eloquent the way the nature does it. When I say to get close to nature, I'm really talking about getting as close to possible to life itself. The apple, as soon as it's picked, goes into a decay state. And so that happens actually at the atomic level. There's uh, the water, you know, theoretical physicists out there in the water space are showing us that when you remove a fruit from the vine, the water structure, the atoms within the water reverse direction from a rightward spin to a leftward spin. If you pull an apple off the, the, the tree and leave its you know, sister right next to it, that they were birthed at the same time on, the, on that tree and they're gonna grow, they grew to you know, fruition at the same time, same rate, they're the same age. You pick one, within three weeks it's got brown spots and it's rotting and the other one left on the tree is still red and thriving. And so the age of that fruit or the dot, death of that fruit is not its chronological age, it's how close to it is it to the source of life? What is the source of life? It's an ever increasing concentration of energy within per cubic centimeter. And that's largely determined by the water spin. And so as soon as you pick something and take it away from its earth source, it reverses its water spin and starts to decay, starts to rot. And so we, when you back up and you realize, wow, we actually are only eating rotting food. <laughs> that's the only fruit you've ever eaten in your life is rotting food. It may not taste rotten yet, but its water structure is already in that 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 antithesis of life. It's already in a death spiral. If you look at every other species as they graze in nature, they only eat off the vine. You've never seen an animal go pick up the, the fruit that's half rotten on the ground, except maybe if you're a pig or something like that. But your vast majority of species are consuming the the living life force of the the food, not the decaying you know, properties of it. So I, I think there's a challenge to us to get closer to life. How close are you to the life force within your food? And it's been well shown that if you pick a carrot, its nutrient availability diminishes by every hour since it's been picked. So if you eat it at six hours, you're much better off nutrient density wise than if it's you know eaten three days later. How close are you to life? And we have not built cities this way. We've built cities to take us away from life force, to separate us from the life force of nature itself. I'm amazed that humans are capable of living in the environment we've created, that we can wake up in an air-conditioned house that has recycled air, hasn't touched nature all night, and we just sit there in these you know, plastic off-gassing sheets on a mattress that off-gasses carcinogens, and then we wake up in the morning and jump into a shower that chlorinates our body so that we kill all the bacteria on our skin, and then we soap up to further destroy the ecosystem. And then we get up and we eat processed food in the morning that destroys our microbiology and opens up the, the tight junctions of our gut, so we got leaky gut. Inflammation is now coursing through your bloodstream by the time you get to the garage to get into your plastic off-gassing car with your windows rolled up and you listen to toxic radio about how humans are the cancer on the planet and then you get to work and you get in an off-gassing cubicle. And how do we even survive a year? It's just insane that we have enough coping mechanisms for stress to produce the society we live in and still survive long enough to have a child. But we are seeing the end of that, that pendulum swing. One in three males is now infertile in all Western countries by sperm count. 
one in four women in, on, in Western countries has polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is another form of infertility. And I don't know if you've seen the, the Google doing the rounds. Google sperm count 2035 or 2045. And they're predicting by 2035 or 2045, the, sperm, the average sperm count in men around the world will be zero. Yeah, I think, you know, they, there's a lot of these kind of, the answers nobody freaking knows. Yeah. All, all we know is going to be less than today with our current trajectory. But we are on course at our current rate of disease accumulation to be at least 80% of us infertile by that time and at least one in three children on the planet born with autism. And so we are nearing that threshold of can we really survive off gassing mattresses and the rest? And the answer is no. Uh, we've produced enough cumulative injury and metabolic challenge to our children that Texas Children's Hospital alone as a single hospital system now is like six skyscrapers to house our children with cancer in Texas. So we have so much cancer in the United States that's not getting talked about. We have so much autism in the United States that's not getting diagnosed and properly managed. We have so much, you know, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and then our elderly there. It's. It, Do you think Alzheimer's, Parkinson's is a metabolic issue? A no. mitochondrial issue? All disease is a metabolic issue. Yeah. All disease is a metabolic issue. There's not enough energy to repair, period. Uh, How much is light playing a role in the process of the body and or specifically the mitochondria specifically to be able to produce energy? Because oftentimes we're taught about the importance of you know, eating a healthy diet, drinking clean water, doing our exercise. Um, but it seems to be, there seems to be a lag around the conversations around um, circadian hygiene light cycles and you know getting the different frequencies and different exposures of light yeah i mean it's a huge piece of the puzzle uh, life life has never occurred yeah. outside of sunshine you know and so the fact that we've demonized sunshine now uh, and we've done it at the level of everybody should have be wearing sunscreen every time you leave the house and we've done it now at the at the geo scale which we're saying well there's too much sunshine therefore there must be global warming therefore we should spray chemicals in our atmosphere to block the sun so that that geoengineering or that sunscreen for the planet is actively being you know sprayed into our atmosphere by planes all over the world since about 2006 something like that and so that that belief that we have too much sun or too many viruses or too much co2 these are kind of the reductionist conclusions of biology that's just simply showing us a failure to be in relationship with nature if we can't handle sun, something deep inside of us is injured. We, we've fundamentally lost our energetics of repair. And when we start replacing sunshine with narrow bandwidth lights, uh, this is probably an LED panel in front of me, I'm not exactly sure, but it looks like you know a, a narrow spectrum light that's, that's on me right now. My body's suffering with that in the sense that it doesn't have a full spectrum stimulation to understand blue to red spectrum. My melanocytes are not responding as they typically would in sunshine, things like that. And so we create these environments in which our body is missing nature. And in missing the nature, my stress goes up. And so to come out of this studio, you and I will do good to take off our shoes, go stand barefoot in nature for a few minutes so that our body can recalibrate to the electromagnetic field of the earth, stare up into the blue sky, ideally lay down on our backs and look th up through a tree because of the, the fractal patterns that happen between tree branches to our eyes, resets our neurologic relationship to the parasympathetic. So we should recode our bodies to nature as soon as we get out of the studio and therefore rapidly reverse the, the toxicity of being separated from nature for this hour, hour and a half time. One of the things I find crazy is the amount of money that people spend to create artificial nature, natural environments. Like $8,000 for these mats that create the Schumann residence, which you could get the same effects of going, standing or lying on the beach. In 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Th this is, you just poke the bears. <laughs> 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 this is one of my deepest things that I'm really working on, just resolving my, my trigger. Um, praying for grace here for myself and humanity, but I'm so frustrated at the biohacking movement. Um, I'm so frustrated that a group of people came along to tell and sell p humans a reductionist version of nature. It's, it's among the deepest lies we've ever faced as a world, is that technology is going to replace nature, and that is driving us into a deeper and deeper fear that we are disconnected from nature and we need all this technology to to palliate 
when in fact we just need to go out and breathe mm. nature we need to go out and lay on the beach or in the water we need to bathe in rivers not in chlorinated showers we need to go you know make love outside not on costco sheets you know whatever it is like it, we, we've got to start remembering that the, the essence of life should always be practiced in nature whether you're eating that food you know breathing the air so is that your philosophy when it comes to supplementation as well like you are much more geared towards getting like your supplementation from whole foods from foods you know as close to farm as possible absolutely is there any I, that's exception me with that? running a supplement company right so i, I yeah. run my own biotech supplement company and we decided within you know our birth process as a company is that how do we put ourselves out of business in the next 30 years like how do we quickly make this an irrelevant belief system that somebody needs soil derivative supplementation because the soil systems on the planet are dead right now well we're gonna have to go create a whole movement around healthy soils and so that's how i end up here in australia right now is with a movement called farmer's footprint that was invested in by our supplement company that said we need a global movement to create soils that make our you know, relevance as a supplement company you know a past understanding or, or a stepping stone towards a truly resilient and regenerative human being. And so Farmer's Footprint is, is helping change the understanding of humans in our relationship to soil systems. And that's at the farm level, at the food level, at the commodities level, all the way up. And so that's really curious. You are invested and in own a supplement company, yet you have invested in Farmer's Footprint. Paul, you can throw that up on the on the main screen. But it makes me curious, what supplements do you endorse? Like, what are the things? Okay, yes, Whole Foods is obviously the best for everybody. But I'm assuming you've got to, unless you can't, then. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm super biased here. So I, my supplement company makes soil supplements. I don't think you oh, can So you make soil supplements. Your supplements are for soils, not for human consumption. It's both. So we right. make them for humans. We make them from soils, but they're all from soil. So right. we do a fossil soil derivative. So we use 60 million year old soil that predates the last extinction event. Right. And the microbiology of the soils at that point were actually more diverse than they are today. Uh, the average depth of topsoil was as deep as 25 feet at that time. Now we're lucky to find 25 centimeters of topsoil. And so we had this thriving soil system at the time. So our company's theory was if we could extract the intelligence of nature at that level of biodiversity, what would happen to human cells? Because human cells have only been around 300,000 years. And so what would happen if we approached the deepest communication networks nature has produced on this planet? And the answer is we heal faster than we ever thought possible. So that was the advent of, of intelligence of nature, which is the company. Um, intelligence of nature basically shows that the deeper we root ourselves in the intelligence of biodiverse systems, the faster we repair, the faster we, we generate what we might call intelligence or beauty. And so we have skin supplement, we have gut supplement, you know, this kind of stuff that as soon as uh, a, a cellular system is informed by this deeper communication network, it starts regenerating at a faster rate. And it's all derived from? Fossil soil. Fossil soil. Dirt. Yeah that like on one hand it's like that's pretty that's pretty cool you're selling dirt but you're selling really intelligent dirt so it's a, so dirt is a description of a bunch of minerals basically yep. what we're extracting is the communication network from the bacteria and fungi that coordinated the production of that dirt and so the bacteria the difference between dirt and soil is life and so the living life force within the soil creates intelligence within the system it does it through these little tiny carbon molecules that are, again, the metabolites of creating energy. Those little carbon molecules we call carbon snowflakes because each bacterial species, fungal species, makes its own little subset of eight or ten variants of these carbon snowflakes, and each species making different snowflake shapes. When you line those snowflakes up, that's when you get that liquid circuit board effect where cells can suddenly speak across languages, across species, and suddenly your mitochondria is talking to the human nucleus, and you're making protein synthesis accelerate across all systems. You're doing cell repair at levels never seen before in a Petri dish. And then you put that in a human system, and it gets really interesting because people have actually an energetic response oftentimes before their cellular you know, stuff has a chance to, to respond or create new new communication networks or detox pathways or whatever the person has an energetic shift of the because they now are feeling life again this is kind of like the apple that's bit into while it's still on the tree if you bite into an apple or a tomato still on the vine everything is is life force 
the soil supplement we're making is literally the life force of the planet. And when you touch that, it changes the spin of everything within yourself. Mm. And so you have an energetic shift with this. And it has a lot of instant kind of weird things that we still don't understand at the biologic level how it happens so quickly. But one of the examples that we see is uh, was actually discovered by a surgeon that was at one of the conferences that when we first started rolling this thing out to the public. He he drank this little you know teaspoon shot glass of this stuff, and it just looks like dirt water. It looks like kind of brownish water. It has no taste to it. She this thing, listens to my little spiel, walks off, comes back 10 minutes later, and he's like, what the hell was in that stuff you just gave me? And I was like, well, I told him again, like carbon molecules, blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, what's actually in it? Because I, I can see better. I can see color <laughs> that I can't usually see. And this is super important because I'm a vascular surgeon, and I rely heavily on my different wow. drainages and pink to red. So from that moment forward, he always drank a shot glass of this stuff before going into the operating room so he could see pink to red grade gradation better and so it's an example of there's an energetic shift in the way in which you perceive reality when you get more information per cubic centimeter mm. and so that's basically what's happening is your cell phone towers are going on it's almost like an upgrading cellular self-awareness of sorts is it? that's pretty amazing you just came to that conclusion because that's exactly one of the first things that happens is self-identity at the cellular level is is occurs because of what we call tight junctions tight junctions are the velcro between human cells your gut lining is the largest single barrier in the body it covers about two tennis courts in the surface area and that's hundreds of billions of cells that are cooperating into a single organism or organ which would be your gut lining that tight junction is uh, a, a complex protein structure that holds the two cells in adjacent uh, to one another such that the gap junctions can form behind it, which are fiber optic cables. And so tight junctions and gap junctions are this way in which a single cell becomes a single organ at the billions and billions of cell levels is there's, there's suddenly a sense of we are gut, I am gut, rather than I am single cell. Mm. And so the identity of the human being is really reliant on that gut membrane being intact. 80% of your immune system lies directly in that one millimeter deep to that barrier. 80% of your immune system is in your gut. If you were to ingest a chemical that breaks all those tight junctions, you lose your self-identity. And the molecule we introduced in 1976 did this. And, so, and this is why we're seeing such a correlation between mental illness and gut function cancer and gut function, yeah, autism everything. and gut function, Alzheimer's and gut function. There's no disease now in the chronic disease epidemic that hasn't mapped back to the microbiome injury. And am I correct in assuming that uh, mitochondria, the greatest concentrations of mitochondria that we have are in the, the brain, the heart, and the gut? Yeah. Your most energy demanding tissues have more mitochondria per cell than any other. And Am I right in assuming from some of the information, because the reason I ask this is because obviously there's a lot of information out there more than ever, and sometimes it's hard to know what's true and what's not, but um, I, I read recently that it was less than 10% of melatonin is produced in the pineal gland, mm -hmm. um, and something like more than 90% is produced in the gut, and in fact, it's the mitochondria that are producing the bulk of the melatonin. Yeah, and I think we're going to find this about a lot of signaling molecules in the body, is that the vast majority are made by bacteria, fungi, mitochondria, and their relationship to the human cells. 90% of the serotonin in your body made in the gut lining, not in your brain. 50% of your dopamine made in the gut lining, not in your brain. And those are being made by enteric endocrine cells, which are human cells, but the human cell can't make the chemical unless the right bacteria are sitting on top of that cell uh, in relationship to it in the gut lining. And it can't make the right chemical unless it's also being exposed to the right environment and light is being an increasingly more important part of that environment. I mean, it's so interesting when you, you're right to keep mentioning light, um, but there's a, you know, Jack Cruz and a lot of my colleagues in that space, I think, have allowed us to believe that when we talk about light, we're talking about visible light, light yeah. spectrum. All matter is light. Mm. All matter is light. And that takes us back actually to the quote that you, you named from the Aubrey Marcus thing that you opened us up with. It's just, I said, why, why can't, are you not blindingly bright right now? It's because you're taking most of that light that you're producing and converting it from a waveform that can come hit me and make me, make you look bright into a particle. 
and wave is turned into particle. So I'm in a constant in state of decoherence. You're in a constant state of becoming solid. Yeah. And then disappearing again and becoming a solid. It happens about every millionth of a second. Every atom disappears, re reappears kind of phenomenon. So your fabric is disappearing and reappearing. It takes so much energy to become solid <laughs> it, because you have to reappear every millionth of a second. Yeah. And so the all of that is light. Planets are light. Stardust is light. I'm light. So we should probably all qualify light. the light conversation in terms of from a circadian perspective. Um, light cycles. I, yeah, and even just losing the word light just so that we kind of, again, get away from the idea of like, well, there's visible light and, and it's red or it's yeah. blue or all these things. Maybe I should wear blue blockers all the time, you know, all these kind of reductive things we keep coming up with in the biohacking world. There's basically coherence and non-coherence. Okay. So the things that we are tempted to call light or tempted to call a protein or tempted to call an enzyme are basically just light in different particle states. And so it's different forms of light. You can either create or destroy energy. Constantly change. That's form. the that's the first law of thermodynamics. It can only change form. And so light changes form such that this looks like a glass, that looks like water inside the glass, this looks like a table that the glass is sitting on. But all of those are just light in different frequency rates. Yeah. Right? And so my body is either gonna be in coherence, which we would call something like life, where you have syntropy, where, where you get organization out of chaos, or I'm going to be in entropy, which means I have this degradation of order. And so when would we talk- that be incoherent? That would be incoherence. Yeah. You know, it would be chaos. And so when we take ourselves out of sunlight and put ourselves in unnatural forms of visible light spectrum, I become less coherent. When I eat chemical foods instead of natural nutrient-dense foods, I increase my, my chaos level. I, I reorder into a decrease in, in coherence. And so this is, this is basically death, right? So a compost pile shows you that all this time you should you throw a melon skin into your compost pile and you know, 14 days later it's dirt. What happened was a deterioration of form. And so what looked like a, a melon skin a moment ago now just looks like black, coherent, you know, homogenous soil is that dissolution that takes us back to the elements and then the elements have to, are, are immediately compelled to go create form again. And so they're gonna, if you don't do anything, then some seed from outside is gonna come in and there'll be a weed there or whatever you wanna call it. Some life is gonna come into that new potential space of the soil that just came out of the melon that disappeared. And so the second law of therm thermodynamics is that any system left in isolation increases its chaos. And the opposite of that, of course, is any system connected or, or witnessed goes into syntropy or organization. The fact that we live in a universe that is always syntropic, things are always forming in our universe to increase their level of complicated systems to exhibit more intelligence and more beauty, suggests that we are always witnessed. We are not alone. We can prove that there's God, if you want to think of it that way, there is a force that witnesses us because we live in a universe that is entropic. Something can see our universe. So it's, not, it's almost like there's something creating this mass observer effect. Mass observer effect. And so that, and that's what creates the particle state. You know, that's that two slit experiment. Yeah. The decoherence from superposition to localized particle. That's non local right. to local. Ma matter, you know, those photons shooting towards the yeah. double slits, unwitnessed will do all the possibilities at once. Yeah. Witnessed, it will choose one, one manifestation, thing. one thing to manifest. We are, wi we are manifesting a universe as a universe. <laughs> and so we are witnessed in that journey towards syntropy, towards organization out of the vacuum. And the vacuum is organizing light energy into particle. And we call those galaxies. And we just found out that we were 100 fold off on our galactic count. <laughs> oh, shoot, it's 2.5 trillion galaxies, um, each with about 8 billion suns. So it, it's just so much organization is occurring in this universe. And it's such a blessed thing to be part of that ordering and to be alive right now. You are the highest expression, expression of cooperative biodiversity that this planet has made so far. The human colon has a more complex biodiversity per cubic centimeter than any other ecosystem on the planet. Wow. So what makes you more intelligent than a coral reef 
your colon holds more biodiversity per cubic centimeter. Oh, wow. What makes you more intelligent than an, than an elephant? More biodiversity per cubic centimeter in your colon. A dolphin, more cubic centimeter per. Can't give a new meaning to the the term in Australia. We have we call people smart asses. You know that's uh, sorry. Do you mind if I um, inquire a little bit more around the light story? Because I did hear something recently, and I'm still early in that journey, and I'm mm-hmm. still trying to understand it and work out what's what's real, what's not. Um, but I heard something that really made me um, look at breatharians in a very different way. Because mm-hmm. breatharians, for a long time, they were referred to as crackpots, mm-hmm. crazy people who live on you know just air alone, sunlight, air, and that's pretty much it. But then I heard this concept uh, from someone that you mentioned around how we as humans reverse osmosis, where we essentially take in light, uh, we take in oxygen, and we produce uh, carbon, water, and sugar, mm-hmm. which essentially feeds the mitochondria to produce energy which would almost put light certain frequencies of light in the category of being almost like a food yeah it's energy food is just you know a concentration of energy yeah so your fruit has a high much much higher density of light light energy than watching the the sunrise but the sunrise has energy in it. Mm. And so you have to stare into the sunrise for probably 45 minutes or something like that. And it actually takes quite a bit of training to get your eye to be able to tolerate that level of light force because most of us will blink and look away. Um, but Qigong masters have long you know, practiced this. You know, there's a portion of the Qigong mastership that is sun gazing. And so you, you stare into that morning sun as it rises across the horizon and train your body to be able to tolerate higher and higher concentrations of that light as it comes up through the atmosphere. Do they ever get to the point where they're doing solar noon or is that like? No, I don't, I mean, I I can't answer that for sure. Maybe somebody has achieved that, but typically it's in that 45 minutes to a couple hour maximum uh, of that sun gazing. But what they've been able to show, studying those guys over a 45, 50 day period where they're just doing sun gazing and not taking in any caloric source from food, is they never go into a fasting biology. They never go into ketosis and no all the other things. They just stay in a fed state. Wow. And so that's, so energy is energy. Mm. Life, again, is more efficient at concentrating it than than a star or a sun is. And but so- most, most humans wouldn't understand that like the sun could be food. Because well, we're, you know, we're told sun is sure. bad, block it out, wear sunglasses, wear clothes, wear sunscreen. Yep. All but, these things are ludicrous. Uh, our social norms are built out of, again, the belief that we are separate from nature mm. and that we need to fear nature and that we should be ashamed of our own nature, our nakedness, our thoughts, our beliefs, our song, our dance. Um, we are so programmed. You know, we just ran this workshop uh, retreat over the weekend for Farmers Footprint here in Australia and had a diverse group of people in and w- one of the workshops that was brilliantly put on uh, was a voice kind of experience where we were all taught to to vocalize together and kind of as the thing progressed we actually got into like this five part harmony but at the outset 80 percent of us answered that we couldn't sing that's a pretty sad statement that in western culture we have you know maybe 80 percent of us now identify that we can't sing whereas if you go to africa and any indigenous culture 100 percent of people know how to sing in fact most of those cultures don't have a word for singer because it'd be ludicrous to call, call anybody a singer because everybody's a singer be like calling them human and so there is no subcategory of human called singer in most cultures uh, historically, and so we had to lose our uh, belief that we could all sing before we would subspecialize into singers. And so there's this deep wound within us that is literally ashamed of every part of ourselves. We do not think we are good enough in anything we do, and that that's a wound we are all dealing with on a daily basis. And the, I believe the only way we get past that, the only way we make this metamorphic shift to understanding that we are nature. In fact, we're the most beautiful thing nature has created on this planet, and therefore we are the most creative, intelligent thing this planet has ever manifest, is to see ourselves in the face of nature. Because looking at one another, we can't see each other because we're hidden behind this egoic shield. We're the only species with the split mind of the ego. And so as we stare at each other, even for this hour and a half, I will never glimpse you because I'm staring at a shield but in your best moments, when you're really coherent and not discoherent, that shield becomes so clean that it looks like a mirror 
functions as a mirror and I can suddenly see myself. And so in human fellowship, the best we do is show each other ourselves. Mm. But we've actually never seen another human being. But you can see a tree and that tree can see you. And this is healing. And so at the end of you know a 30 year journey in medicine, I closed my clinic last year and now run a coaching program as an eight week training back into nature, knowing that nature is the only place you're gonna actually find yourself. It's called journey of intrinsic health and that the health is always intrinsic to your original design. It's the, your original design is the only place from which you were able to self-organize in a mother's womb into the miracle you are. How do we tune you back into that original math, that original understanding of who you are? And again and again, we find that the answer is only in nature, meaning everything outside of human. Because in our belief that humans are the only thing writ out of nature, we had to develop an ego. An ego is a collective belief system that we all hold on to that protects us from the understanding that we are rejected, that we are not enough. So how do you feel about um, technology? And I want to expand on that before I um, finish the question. Like we're seeing now the advent of AI, the advent of Meta, Neuralink, um, so many technologies that are essentially, as you said earlier, trying to replace nature. Um, where do you see, like, and again, I'm not expecting you to be a crystal ball guy or a fortune teller, but where do you see this all going? Because it's almost like in my mind, I'm like, it would take either a massive shift in the narrative, which on some level would require some form of a, uh, someone to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In order for. Yeah. I mean, I think I don't have to like su do any supposition on this. I think we can simply look at what's already happening right in front of us. And the, and the reality that's unfolding is we have two realities that are, that are starting to diverge. Uh, those divergent realities are one that believe that we will never be enough and that we need to palliate our condition into extinction, but with more and more technology that can bandage us up, that can kind of step in where we have failed. And then there's this other reality that I get to be in all the time because of my occupation has taken me into this intersection between human health and, and food systems and, and planetary health. I think I've toured more farms and And they are creating a, a reality in which they are so enraptured by the biodiversity that they're creating in these gardens and food systems. They're creating literally, you know, thousands of species within every cubic meter um, through their ingenuity. Over just a short period of time, 18 months, you can create this explosion of life beneath your feet that then nourishes your entire community. That's a reality that is already working on the planet. And we're doing this in rural Africa and we're doing this in, you know, middle of Europe, UK, here in Australia, when communities get replugged into their nature, all kinds of beautiful things start to happen because we're healing the original wound that, that said we were separate from nature, that said that there was therefore scarcity, that said we therefore needed ownership. If we have ownership, then we're gonna need colonialism. If we're gonna need colonialism, then we're gonna have to give up on our indigenous natural law and gonna have to adapt some version of divine law that says, because we can you know, think faster, or because our God is better, we can you know, rape, pillage, and destroy everything else around us and take all the resources. Natural law is baked into the fabric of reality. And so there's gonna be a portion of us that find our way back into systems of natural law in which everything is sovereign and in its sovereignty attracts abundance. And in its abundance, it comes to respect and value polarization or opposites opposite opinions, opposite worldviews, opposite energies, so that there can be balance, so that there can be yin-yang, so that there can be light and dark in the same space. That's a reality that's already emerging, and I want to be a part of that reality. I want my grandchildren to be part of that reality. And there's another segment of population that is rapidly getting so divorced from nature that it seems reasonable to put on a, a set of you know virtual reality goggles and sit on a couch all day long you know, being entertained by a virtual world that is is 
disconnected it's, from your epigenetic it's memory. It's ironic that some people like. are putting you on a set of you know, augmented reality or virtual reality glasses to go and walk through a forest. What would you say to a parent out there and um, who perhaps, you know, has been, you know, really going out there, forging their own way, but then having this awareness, starting to move away from technology, starting to move away from, I guess you could say, centralized convention. But then they have this thought of, oh, but, you know, am I depriving my kids of opportunity in the future by not allowing them to, you know, engage with the technology at the level that other kids are? You know, am I, you know, setting my kids up for, you know, because pretend- I know there are some people out there, I get to speak to them on a regular basis to go, well, I'm concerned if I don't let my kids play with technology, then, you know, when they're of age, they're not going to have the skills required to um, to be able to get employment. If, if you want your child to be an employee the rest of their lives <laughs> and get paid to build other people wealth, then I, I think you're on the right track to introduce your kids to all the current technology. If you would like your child to be the Elon Musk of the future that builds a new humanity uh, within the template of nature rather than the fear that this planet's not enough and need to go to Mars, then the next Elon Musk is not going to believe we need to leave this planet. The next Elon Musk is going to see that everything is abundant here and we can support 18 billion people on this planet easily with, with food sufficiency and energy sufficiency and no waste products to poison the planet, etc. There's children that are being raised in their magic still. And those children will create the universe that I want to live in. It'll be, it is one of those diverging paths. And those kids will be the, my Elon Musk of my elder years. And um, I'm going to celebrate the heck out of those kids that devise technologies of the future based on biomimicry because they spent so much time staring at the structure of leaves in the forest. Well, I hope that's confirmation for a lot of people. Mate, this has been an illuminating conversation, but I'd also love to let people know, because like, there's going to be some people who are going to want to know where they can find out more about you. We're going to post all the socials, links, Farmer's Footprint. Um, but we have a lot of people that are interested in health, nutrition, biohacking. Um, where can they find out more about your mm-hmm. your supplementation brand, the, the, the vitamins mm-hmm. and stuff that you do? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit frustrating in, our, in Australia. Uh, the, the website is called intelligenceofnature.com. Um, it's frustrating because you guys have uh, a regulatory uh, body called the TJA, and the, um, that group has um, banned its importation over the last couple of years. It used to be available here, um, but we're in a six-year process of getting you know drug status, kind of uh, grass status on our our product, so that it can eventually get back down here to Australia. Um, there's some ways in which you can get it through my USA address and things like that, but it, overall it's just challenging to get here in Australia at the moment. So if you've got friends coming from the U.S., have them fill up a suitcase for you, intelligenceandnature.com. Um, the, I would say you know, to send you to the, to the kind of the broadest uh, information stream, just go to the ZachBushMD.com website. Uh, that website um, has a ton, you know, many dozens of hours of free content. I would point you to the knowledge page. I put out something called the Global Health Education Summit that I did every month for the duration of the pandemic and put very long form content up there around what is a virus, what is you know an immune system, what is GMO, uh, so that we can really start to um, stop you know, believing or trusting the science when it's given to us in these reductionist fear tactics and start to reintroduce ourselves to a nature that's never been against us. Did the senses really love you during that period? I think they did in that they got a job <laughs> by censoring me. Without me, they would have been, been hired probably. So um, yeah, I mean, we dealt with censorship for sure. We had to put it behind you know, different, different walls and everything else for some of the content. but. Uh, all the content's out there and free right now. And, you know, the, the social media is a different environment than it was two years ago. Mm-hmm. The the stuff that's you're able to see daily on Instagram would have been taken down in a heartbeat three years ago. Um, so there's there's a porousness to the social media, which I like. It, basically, the leaky gut that's mm-hmm. phenomenal is happening to social media, too. It's got a leaky gut, and it can't block like it can't used to it because everybody's telling truth now. And yeah. everybody's, you know, shooting truth on their cell phones whether it be you know police violence all the way to ufos like the amount of information coming through right now is just unstoppable because the public is starting to see things that we had a hard time seeing before we're seeing patterns and making connections because we're becoming more intelligent and i believe that we are going to supersede ai i um i had a um 
quite a big stroke end of 2021 followed by heart surgery and then a fairly significant crash and i found myself in the middle of a about a nine month recovery process it was pretty pretty severe pretty serious um re almost rebuilding every aspect of myself from the ground up it was it was almost like you know people talk about the dark night of the soul and i felt like it was a 365 uh, dark nights of the soul for me and so I had to learn a lot about myself I was burnt to the ground but in the process you know I've really I've learned a lot about myself I've learned a lot about um, health nature like reconnecting with nature like I used to have what I probably classify as a pretty severe technology addiction now I can't I can't get away from it enough like I barely I barely even touch my phone well barely like I I don't enjoy spending time in technology I do everything I can to avoid technology um, but I've got back to whole foods, you know, um, paddock to plate. Like I go to the farmer's markets every week. I'm eating everything fresh, everything from in season, everything local. Um, and so I'm not one to push products, but there was one product that I got introduced to that I'm really curious to get your perspective on. And it's not a product that is necessarily pushed by a brand, but it's a product that's been around for a long time, methylene blue. Um, and it kind of, it connects with the conversation around um, mitochondria and mitochondrial function and um, the respiration chain, cellular respiration, mitochondrial mm -hmm. respiration. Do you have an opinion on on that? Because I've I've heard a lot of people using it for a range of things that I won't mention here mm -hmm. because it'll attract a lot of unwanted <laughs> attention. Yeah, I mean it's it's not a naturally occurring compound. Yeah, um, that's my only so concern. It's, it's you know a chemical compound that basically uh, can palliate some of our disconnect. It, 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 the the only injuries in which it becomes really relevant is acute injury to the red blood cell and so where, when you show up hypoxic uh, through an acute injury and so most of the blue syndromes of the recent years whether it was MERS, uh, SARS, COVID, people were showing up blue in ICUs without any evidence of pulmonary infection, no fevers. They would always show up blue first and then a few days later they might have a spike of fever and lungs might flu fill with fluid and they might a few weeks later die with no viruses you know causing any problem at that point but the beginning of the injury the beginning of the syndrome that became known as you know these viral phenomenon was always this hypoxic injury and that is called histotoxic hypoxia medically. Uh, histotoxic hypoxia is the condition in which your red blood cells can't carry and release oxygen appropriately. Is that like meth hemoglobin anemia, similar kind of? Yeah, exactly. It's right. a change in shape of the hemoglobin uh, through a toxin exposure. And the toxin that we've all been exposed to to create these phenomena in 2002, 2012, 2020 was very, very high uh, concentrations of forest fire uh, debris in the air. And so uh, large fires produce a huge amount of PM 2.5, which is a large carbon molecule that clusters viruses and carries cyanide. Cyanide poisoning is the thing that uh, creates these, these blue syndromes of hypoxia. And so cyanide poisoning occurs when the PM 2.5 gets to a certain level in the at in general atmosphere and it has the opportunity to interact with respiratory viruses and cyanide. So that's kind of how this all occurs. So it's not the virus that's causing the problem. It's the cyanide that got carried into the biology by that. Again, that my website's got you know, hours of content around how all that biology plugs together. Methylene blue happens to uh, interrupt some of the that uh, pattern of the red blood cell and uh, it goes all the way down to the respiratory chain of the mitochondria as well. So basically it reinvigorates a respiratory system that for a moment went on pause. And so uh, if there was a role for it, it'd be kind of in that kind of ICU environment. But I would, would not recommend that, you know, the general public is taking that chemical. Because it's almost become like a biohacking supplement for a lot of people. So is, so is you know, something like metformin, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so, dr again, does longevity come from a low morning blood sugar? And the answer is absolutely no. That's not, that's not a measure of longevity. That's a measure of basically the amount of insulin in the human bodies, you know, the biologic function of insulin in the body. And so there's lots of ways we can be reductionist about biology and therefore come to these kind of short-sighted views as to how we create health or how we embrace that health. But uh, so, yeah, I don't want to completely dog the the biohacking industry because there's there's important th changes that are happening the ones that are about touching nature again but 
the cold plunge that you should be doing is out in the creeks that I just was doing here in Australia, saying with one of your celebrities here last couple of days who who's gotten who's no longer a celebrity because the social media decided to eliminate that celebrity status <laughs> recently. Um, but staying staying there, it's a daily routine to get up first thing in the morning, go go just uh, bathe in the creeks that are coming off those mountains and. That is such a better experience than, you know, somebody's freezer that they've turned into an ice bath in their backyard and you're getting into this plastic tub with floating ice versus sitting there blowing your mind over the orchids that are hanging down to the stream and the, the root systems that are dangling down to touch that surface of the water and you're looking up at clouds floating over uh, in a blue sky between the tree branches that are resetting your neurology to make you believe in something that's worth living for. Um, so it's not that biohacking was wrong, that cord, cold plunging is good for your mitochondrial metabolism. It is. But is it good for your psyche to be sitting isolated in a bath, suffering, you know, a, a frigid cold experience versus the original, you know, experience of plunging into the ocean in the morning or going into a cold, you know, freshwater stream? And so we, we have to remember that biohacking is basically a petri dish version of life. And if we try to keep applying the technologies of the Petri dish to the human, we can expect more and more isolation. And I think this is kind of the phenomenon you see with biohacking. At some point in the process, you become so obnoxious to hang out with because you're so excited <laughs> about your new technology you want to talk about. Nobody wants to hang out with you. Yeah. So you become isolated, in which case you become completely psychotic about your new technologies. And now you're your classic biohacker. And so I, we have to, we just have to just take everything with a big freaking, you know, ball of salt at this point that, that whenever somebody comes along and says, here's the technology that's you know, going to solve your thing and make you live forever or whatever it is, or make your blood sugar, morning blood sugars lower and give you some sort of arbitrary or abstract metric or endpoint for, for your today's version of health, we're going to be lonely in the end. And that's, that's not how longevity has ever happened. When we study the blue, blue zones it, over and over again, we can't find a single diet that defines the reason these people live over 100 years old. They all live at different altitudes, different distances from the ocean. Like we can't find a single unifying thing until you go and sit and talk to those cultures. And, and over and over again, they say it's because we have societies that communal. are communal and multi-generational. Mm -hmm. And you know, my, mo my best teaching came from this couple from Icaria, Greece. They, they had come, been flown out of their little island in the Greek I islands to come to the U.S. to prepare this dinner for a bunch of, you know, quote unquote thought leaders. And all of us were just dumbfounded by the intelligence of the, these two people who had no, no formal or higher education. Um, and yet they showed more brilliance and intelligence than any of us put together. And one of the main things they told us after my great toast that I did at the end of the dinner that they had prepared, I gave this 10 minute, you know, rolling toast that was so beautiful. I was even crying and, <laughs> and, uh, the gentleman stands up at the end of it and said, well, doc, that's all very interesting, but you're completely wrong. We don't live long because of the nutrient density or the my mitochondria or the bacteria. I don't even know what most of those words mean, but the reason we live long is because we always sit in an extra chair at the table, hoping somebody we don't know shows up for dinner. Mm. And I was just so rocked by that to realize that in my scientific fascination, I had missed the purpose of food altogether, which was human fellowship. And the only reason we live long is if we enjoy human fellowship. And, and that's really important for us to remember as a biohacking society. And we biohack all the time. You know, should I have coffee? Should I not have coffee? We, we're constantly changing biology by our little social decisions. And a good example of just how powerful this fellowship is, is a study that came out of Ohio recently. Um, they, they were trying to show, you know, all the, the cancer consequences to herbicides and pesticides in our food system. And they had all these rabbits and they were giving different concentrations of herbicides and pesticides in their food. And there was this one cohort that was among the most poisoned of the rabbits that just would not get sick and they would not, you know, they were just thriving didn't fit into the, the data at all. And so they went through all kinds of stuff at the end of the study when they realized this was this outlying cohort and they couldn't figure out, they just rechecked things. Finally, they went and talked to the tech who was feeding the, the rabbits. It was like, you know, what's going on here? How do you feed them? And they're like, oh, well, I freaking love rabbits. And I will stroke them for 10 minutes before I feed them and just tell them how much I love them, how beautiful they are, how intelligent they are. Then I feed them. 
Aww. That man's love was so potent that he transmuted the poisons that he was about to feed those animals. So as a mother right now, it's terrifying to try to feed your children because you know you're giving them poison. There's just no way around it right now. But you can transmute that if you will look your child in the eye, say, I love you so much. Tell me about what happened today. What did you get curious about? What did you create today? And in that child being seen and feeling loved, they will transmute every toxin humans can throw at them and they will live strong and they will create the future we want. Wow, that um, is a beautiful way to finish um, what can only be described as a very informative, very illuminating conversation. Mate, we're gonna throw up all those links, all the information about um, how people can connect and learn more about what you do. Um, I didn't expect that we we're gonna get this opportunity to be able to connect and so I feel more than um, underprepared, but incredibly overwhelmed at the opportunity to be in fellowship with you, mate. So from my heart to your heart, from my family to yours, thank you so much for the time, mate. It's, uh, I hope this is the first of many conversations to come. It's been a privilege. Um, you're clearly around some incredible folk with Blair and the Farmer's Footprint team. Um, and yeah, I know our community is going to just get an enormous amount of value from this podcast. Thank you so much, Zach. Thanks for being here. We hope you all join the community. The Farmer's Footprint movement here in Australia is really creating that future that we all it feel really is. is possible. Mm. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you guys. Much appreciated. This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive, but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com